Good morning from Panhandle Outdoors, America's only daily outdoor TV show. Your source for fishing, hunting, and information for folks who enjoy the great outdoors. Now sit back, relax. It's Panhandle Outdoors. Good morning, folks. Welcome to Panhandle Outdoors. I'm Winston Chester. Glad you're here on this Tuesday morning. We've got a big show lined up. A lot of stuff going on this week. But first, let's talk about our weather brought to us by Hainan Technical Center at the corner of Baldwin and Highway 77. High today is going to be 88 and low 75. Water temperature is right here at 85.1 degrees. And well, a lot of times we go through this weather, we just nonchalantly go through it and all, but it's, uh, weather's very important. I'm going to get to a story in a little bit and, and explain what I'm, what I'm talking about, where I'm coming from today. The actual river breeze brought to us by Sand Hill Seafood and Restaurant. That price code at Blunstown, steady at a 4.1. It's in good shape, okay? The, but the Chocolate Hatch at Caraville, 9.4, and it's going up. It's rising from all this rain we have. We've had all throughout this panhandle up in South Alabama, a lot of effect on the Choctahatchee River. Uh, like I say, now that water temperature is pretty steady in the rivers too. Not a lot of movement on, on that. Tide chart brought to us by Kent Forest Lawn Funeral Home and Cemetery. Today is Tuesday, April the 8th, and we're looking at great tides today. And really good tides uh, the rest of this week. My Saturday is not looking really good on our tidal chart. But anyway, uh, to take a look at the marine forecast, it'll be coming out of south at about 5 to 10. Let's take our break. We'll be right back. Okay, welcome back. Let's tell a story. I want to, uh, you know, a lot of times to show pictures. Now, we'll do that later. I just got to get into this story and tell you what's fresh in my mind. We had this tournament this past weekend and didn't talk about it yesterday, but today we're going to talk about it because it's an interesting tournament we had, and I'm not going to tell you a lot about the tournament. I do want to tell you about an incident that happened that has so much uh, emphasis with that we talk about on the weather and all. You know, we're always talking about the weather. I was telling y'all, preaching y'all about watch the weather, you know, be, be aware of it, do this and do that. And, you know, so what happened Sunday morning, and, and I really mean it, you know, it's really, really important. So anyway, I'm going to try to put this in a, in a nutshell. Sunday morning, we get up for our second day of fishing in the tournament. I look on the radar, got two little spot showers, and we, we knew we were going about 33 miles south, southwest of Carabell. And we're in a 25 foot 1987 Grady White. So we'll get, you know, we load up, have all the bait and everything, get out there. And it's, you know, they're predicting seas about two foot, which has been about normal. So we'll get out there that morning. And, and you know, the second day, we didn't do very good the first day. So we had a game plan. So we started uh, getting out there about and caught some, some nice, you know, decent fish. So anyway, I would notice the weather. I was a storm over to my, to my left, which had been to my, to my northwest. A little storm coming up, which is no big deal. but. Then I started noticing another one starting on the northeast, and and you know waves were got at about three foot. We weren't really thinking too much about it, and you know we you know we didn't have the radar. We don't have we don't have big weather radar out there. So normally, uh, and we talked about it. We caught a, we, you know we did we're doing pretty good in that spot, and we were anchored, and the sea started building up a little bit, and and the wind started picking up a little bit, and and as you know where I'm going with this, it started and it started seeing a little bit of lightning. So uh, the lightning was way off, but we could see it across the water. So we decided we better, well, we're gonna try to ride it out. We're anchored down and the sea's picking up, got to bow into the wave. So, you know, but then, you know, all of a sudden the water started uh, really getting up and picking, you know, getting over the bow. And we decided we better go ahead and pull up that anchor. And by that time, uh, we normally what you try to do we, we can go around the storm. You know, you can see it on, and, and sort of go around it. Uh, but these, we had two storms coming at us. It was almost like a perfect storm, left and right. And waves just started, you know. So we decided to head to the hill at right around noon, a little bit after about 12:30, I guess. And we tried to try to head to the hill. By that time, the waves were about six to seven foot, and it was blowing, and the lightning was starting popping. In fact, as we were pulling off, there was a tower behind us, and lightning hit the tower behind us. But we just had a, it was very slow going. Now, it ended up being the. Uh, the worst storm any of us had ever been in. And it, it just because it built up, it was so intense. And it lasted over an hour of us going through this stuff and all. And to think about those storms and all, and what we were not scared or anything, but we were, you know, we were very much on, on alert and very, uh, you got to hold on with both hands because the boat, it's not like you see on TV, just waves coming in like that. You got a wave coming this way, then you got one coming back this way. It's not the rolling wave. So you just get, you get up like this and you're going to boom, sometimes come out of water and just land. And when you do, it just jars the whole body. So it, 
it was an amazing experience as far as just trying to hold on for dear life. And we, you know, we had two engines and we were going steady and really slow. Water coming over the bow. Uh, lightning wasn't popping around us, but there was lightning. And it was, you know, we were in a situation where we knew we just had to keep going, but we couldn't go straight back because of the waves were coming straight at us. So we sort of, you know, at an angle and it come back an angle. It took us almost two hours to get like 30 miles back to the, the hill. By the time we were, got, we were getting back, and in the last 30 minutes or so, it had calmed, you know, the storm had gotten on by, but very intense for over an hour, and then sort of laying down about an hour and a half, and at a two hour mark, it had, just, it had calmed down. The sun was coming out when we got back to land. But what I was telling you, you've got to have such respect for the weather. I don't care what kind of boat you are in and where you are. Now, think about it. When you see the when you bay fish, and I was thinking about driving home last night. I mean Sunday night. Uh, you, when you're in the bay or Lake Seminole or something, you're within 15 minutes of a landing. Uh, really, anywhere in West Bay, Chattahatchee Bay, Apalachicola Bay, you can get back to a landing within 15 minutes anywhere, uh, unless you wait to the last minute and the waves are building up on you. So, but out there, you just can't do it. I tell you how rough it was. We heard Coast Guard come on the radio, and of course we couldn't transmit because. Uh, it was so intense, but we could hear the Coast Yard came on, you know, there, you know, when they come on out of Mobile, Alabama, said EPIRB has just gone off, basically, is what they were telling us, EPIRB, EPIRB. It was in a Carabelle area. They give a number, and you, could know, you know where the number is. It's in a Carabelle area. And what had happened, one of our other boats fishing tournament, there were 55 boats fishing the tournament, and one of the boats, the water had gotten up over, you know, washed over them. And when those EPIRBs, I said electronic positioning, reconnaissance, would send the signal, uh, life-saving signal to, to uh, the satellite and the Coast Guard, by law, has to re respond to it. So they sent a Coast Guard cutter out in that direction. The EPIRB had gone off. When we got back and got a full story later on uh, that afternoon, we talked to the captain. What had happened, water had washed over and got into the EPIRB. And they didn't even know it was going off. They got in the EPIRB and sent a signal to the satellite, and and you know finally they, they got it. You know they kept on radio. They got by and and, and uh, you know relinquished to say they were okay and relinquished the Coast Guard duty of having to come pick them up. But that's how rough it was. And I, I, what I'm telling you this: when you get out there, it can really get rough. And it, like I say, all three of us, Tony, myself, and Wendy, said it was the worst storm we'd ever been in. Per se, as far as the we, the you know, it, all the the weaving of the waves are coming in at you at different angles and all. That's sort of what really uh, gets you going, and your body just gets all beat up and all, and uh, literally. And, and got back, we got back to land. Though a lot of other boats went through the same thing. They had the same experiences. Some were a little bit closer than we were. And we were pretty far out. So anyway, I just want to share that with you. When I say have a healthy respect for the weather. I mean that from personal experience, and I've, I've been through a lot of storms and all, fresh water, salt water, but this past weekend was about the most intense storm we'd ever been in, and I just wanted to uh, pass that on to you. And like I say, we're in a 1987 uh, 25-foot boat. There were a lot of bigger boats out there that didn't have, a, didn't have that much of a problem. And we had a cabin, but these center console boats, of course, people just, you know, you soak from head to toe. So anyway, I just want to pass that on to you. Uh, let's take a quick break and come back with some other stuff. Okay, welcome back. To add on to what I was saying in that last segment, I, I do want to tell you, I've got a video coming up. Tomorrow, Fred Myers is coming in, and Fred's got a great story to tell you about his, his recent tournament. But then the next day, we'll, we'll go ahead and do the uh, video of it. I'm not going to tell you what happened. I'm going to leave you in suspense. If y'all, I ran a lot of y'all down there, you sort of know what happened. But really good tournament. But uh, I, I do want to say this. We went to, uh, Saturday was not a good day. We got together Saturday night, sat down at, at supper and talked all about it and changed our game plan. We went to a game plan on Sunday, and our game plan, we stuck with it. And a lot of other people didn't do it, didn't stick with the game plan. We stuck to our game plan, and it, it, it paid off for us. But I just want to tell you, always have a game plan, and don't be afraid to stick to it. And we're, Fred and I are going to talk about this tomorrow, too, even in red fishing. You have a game plan. You have, also have a backup plan B. And I know that's, it may sound far and people don't fish a lot, but that is so important. In your head, you got to know what you're going to do, A and B. But, you know, if you think, if you've got a gut-level feeling about doing something, do it and stick with it. And we did, and we were rewarded uh, by doing that. So, anyway, let's talk about red fishing. Uh, I got a uh, notice from CCA the, on the redfish tournament. I'm just, this is an update on it now. To date, Anglers have caught 19 tagged redfish, okay? And you saw all the beautiful prizes, all the boats, that big truck and all that. But listen to this. You think 19 prizes are gone? No. 
Only three people were registered to call the 19 tag redfish. So they, here's the remaining prizes. Uh, if you catch a, a tag redfish, okay, the GMC Sierra truck is still available. I'm gonna go fishing today. And uh, two or three nice boats and all, a Maverick and all, really some really nice boats and other stuff. Uh, okay, and other division two and all kinds of stuff. Anyway, it's still open for that, okay? I do wanna, let's go from uh, fishing now to scalloping and as you know, we're sort of on hold as far as scalloping in St. Joe Bay. I do want to give a report from Stan Hatchie. I've talked to several people that, you know, goes down there pretty regular. Uh, been going down there for a couple of years, and this uh, last year was a banner year. This year, you know, I mean, they would go in last year and within an hour load up the boat, you know, like the old days of St. Joe Bay. Well, they did that last year. They're not doing that this year. Now, a lot of people, they're limiting out, but it's taken them a lot longer this year, and that's the same format that happened in St. Joe Bay. I remember we used to go limit out real quick and then you know, come back. And, but anyway, I've told you all that story, but then it started taking us longer to limit out. I'm talking about gallon, five gallon bucket fulls. And now, so anyway, the Stent Hatchy area is doing the same thing. It's the uh, same pattern, and you can probably graph it and show the same chart of, uh, reflecting St. Joe Bay and Stent Hatchy. Anyway, with that being said, uh, the the Position. I want to go ahead and make a give you my position on how I feel about scalloping in St. Joe Bay. I've given a lot of thought. I, I consider myself a conservationist. I consider myself a, a consumer of fish and game. Uh, I hunt it. I hunt and I consume the meat. I fish. I eat the fish that I catch and I, you know, scallop and all that. But I also believe very strongly about preserving what's out there and taking care of it. I just, I just always, it's not something I didn't just jump into. I felt that way my whole life. With that being said, I want to give you my position. This is Winston Chester representing Panhandle Outdoors position on scalloping in St. Joe Bay for the year 2017. At this point in time, I feel like we should not have the scallop season in St. Joe Bay. Now, I know it's gonna make some of y'all angry and just you know, throw, it, throw stuff at a TV and all that, but I just feel that at this point in time, uh, you know, just go ahead and keep it closed. There's not a lot of there's not a lot of scallops out there. There are some, and we let a lot of people come in here and just get what's out there. That the population is going to stay down. Are you talking about some? I'm talking from 40 plus years of scallop in St. Joe Bay. I know what I'm talking about. This year, leave them alone. The people I've talked to, I've talked to some very strong business owners in St. Joe. Guess what? They feel the same way. I've talked to people who live down there, and they feel the same way. Just let them alone this year. Let them let them continue to recover and maybe it'll be better next year. So this is my position on it, and uh, stay with it. You, know, you can say what you want to about it, but that's how I feel about it. And you can always go down to Tarpon Dock or, or you know, some seafood market and if you want scallops that bad, just buy you some. And you can always take the kids out snorkeling and really, when everything's said and done, they're not gonna know much difference between picking up a regular shell or starfish than getting a scallop. So uh, that's how I feel about it, okay? And speaking of that way, I want to tell you, a lot of people don't understand why I spend so much time talking about scalloping. I talk about the passion people have for the outdoors and, and particular things like when you hunt and got to, some people got to get that big buck, some people got to catch that sailfish and all that. I, I do more of a little bit of everything, but uh, the scalloping, now, we ran into some people, we uh, went to Carabelle early and you know for the tournament and Gail and I sort of ride around and see things and all. And, and I just, I love that area. So we're going on down past Carabelle the other day to a place, Lenark Village. You heard me talk about Lenark Village. There's a nice little boat ramp there, a little grocery store, sort of where the locals hang out. So I stopped by there and <laughs> ran into a family. This lady come in to get some, get a little snack with the two little girls and she wanted, and of course I spoke to her and and, uh, and she was wanting to know where she could go scalloping. So I, my ears perked up and I, I started talking to her. Folks, they were from Hattiesburg, Mississippi. And she wanted, uh, they'd come down from Hattiesburg. They were staying over in Destin and they, they drove down from Destin to Carabelle and she just wanted her girls to just go walk out there and pick up a scallop. She had heard about it for years and all and she, they drove down just for that. That's the passion people have for doing things like that. So I, I told Gail, I said, I'm gonna go out of the car and get the camera and interview, interview her because people aren't going to believe the story unless they hear it from her. So we're right here in the grocery store, very impromptu, short interview, and I got to speak to the little girls too. But this is, and her husband was out, and he was, he was frustrated because he had to drive from Destin, and he said, uh, he said, never seen anything like that Panama City Beach traffic. He said, he said, he was asking me how he could go from Carabelle back to Destin without going through Panama City. But anyway, let's, uh, Jeff, let's roll this little video. 
Hi folks, I drove all the way on past Carabelle at Lenark Village. This is the Lenark Market, and I just stopped by here because there's a boat ramp here. We're going to check up on the scallop and everything. And we're here at this a big grocery store. And uh, listen, I ran into this lady here. I, she's got a wonderful story. Okay, tell the folks, what's your name? Katie Dixon. Ka Katie, that was my mom's name, so we made an instant bond. Plus, she's from Hattiesburg, Hattiesburg Mississippi. Mississippi. I just need one scallop. Oh, yeah. you just gotta one. Tell the, you got to tell the story. Y'all came. You from and, Hattiesburg. You I've and got your my, family. We did. My family, we came from Hattiesburg. We just need one, two scallops, one for my six-year-old and one for my 12-year-old. Am I going to get two? Okay. Now, we gotta, we're going to have to help her get a couple of scallops, okay? But anyway, uh, that's how much. How did you hear about scallop way down here? Um, well, we've always heard about the scalloping and always wanted to come and bring our kids yeah. and eat well, some fresh oysters while we're here. And right. I want you to tell the folks on Panhandle Outdoors, good morning. Good morning, Panhandle Outdoors. Okay, very good. <laughs> All right, go ahead, take care of everybody. I'll get you one. These are the two kiddos. Oh, the well, kiddos. See, we already ready in our swimsuit and everything. Look at it. <laughs> Wait, what is it? Are you going scalloping, honey? Tell him. Can you go here? Go tell, tell, talk to him. Tell, tell the folks, turn around and tell this lady here where you're going. Where are you going? Scalloping. Scalloping. And where are you from? Mississippi, Hattiesburg. Mississippi, Hattiesburg. And what about you? Hattiesburg, Mississippi. Are you going scalloping? Mm -hmm. How many do you want to get? A lot. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, coming up now, this Friday night, we talked about it. Here it is, the National Wild Turkey Federation, the banquet. Uh, be there. It's going to be at 6 o'clock. Ken Parabore's number, people ask about the number. I'll give it to you one more time. 832-0718. 832-0718 if you want to get tickets and all. And that'll be this Friday at 6 o'clock downtown at First Methodist Church. Take a look at our fishing game time for today. Brought to us by Blue Water Outriggers. Looking at 111 or 311 this morning we passed, but this afternoon after lunch, 135 to 335. Okay, I got a couple of pictures. Let's check these out right here. This is interesting. This is called off Russell Field, Fields Pier. Check, look at that sailfish there. Here's a better picture of it. Okay, uh, Rob sent it to us. This is called, uh, it was actually Tuesday morning. Rob Sutton caught this, okay, it was last week, and that is a nice sailfish. That's really a nice selfie. It's caught off the pier. Okay, you know that was a thrill. And I thought it's a good idea here. Emily Simmons, uh, they bought three kayaks, and her husband said, fit them in the back of the truck. But look how they built a nice little rack so you can put three kayaks in it. Now, I love to see little projects like this. I would I always love doing this kind of stuff. And a neat idea, you can strap them down and take three kayaks in the back of the truck, just like that. Very good. Okay. Having pictures and ideas, always send them to me. Uh, anything you get it done. If a lot of times people, I get a lot of these pictures off my Facebook page that people send, and uh, but I get a lot of them messages and all off of uh, off the phone. In fact, I need to find one now. I'm going to try to uh, find one that was sent to me recently. Okay, uh, I'm not going to be able to find. It. I'm gonna, I'll show it to you tomorrow. Okay, I'll show it to you tomorrow. Anyway, I can get it by messages, I can get them phone calls, I can get them emails, a phone call and tell them a story that I relay it, or I can get it on Facebook or, or uh, the old hard copy pictures we don't do anymore. I do want to mention also, uh, we've got some fall sweepstakes. We, every year at fall, we like to give away prizes and all. I've got a, all kinds of stuff I've been collecting recently, and some rod and reels again, and some packages of, you know, shirts and caps and uh, visors and, and uh Coozes and it's all kind of stuff that uh, I think you'll like. So we're got, uh, we're going to do it out of pickle jar, the same one. So uh, don't don't forget about that. Also get you know people email me a lot or call me and coach how you do this how you do that. And again I want to tell you I, I don't consider myself uh, really an expert at really anything, but I, I flat know I can catch some fish and I, I know I can uh, uh, look at some game and take shots at some game. I, I can do that on a regular basis. I will be glad to share with you, and as far as how to, I'll tell you everything I'm always fishing with and all. I've got, you know, I haven't fished much this last couple of months and all because of various things, but I've got some, a lot of fishing trips coming up. When I go out with people on, on charter boats and all, that's pretty well self-explanatory on how we do it. And on, on the King Michael tournament, I, if you King Michael fish, uh, you pretty well know what you're doing. We do, all do it basically the same way. You can do a couple of things. You can troll for them, or you can bump troll. When you bump troll, you sort of just what bump you just sort of hit, you know, just hit the throttle, bump it real quick, and just pull it back. And that's a slow troll, and it's sort of like that. 
and we use live bait to do do that. Key to that, uh, all the fish we always uh, we catch most of the time. I would say most of the time, not all the time. We catch them on live bait. And the thing about that, if you catch a live bait, you got to keep them alive, and that's always a challenge. But anyway, on, on that, uh, King Michael fishing is fairly simple. You just got to be on some structure, somewhere around some structure. And uh, I, I laugh about it uh, because it's the same way if you're bass fishing or if you're doing, you know, brim fishing or, what, you know, mahi, mahi, they're going to be wearing some kind of structure unless they're migrating through. So there were some, uh, you know, nice kings caught. Getting the redfish, I, I bring some of the best people that, that, that we have around here, like Fred Myers, talking about redfishing. Now, I love the redfish, and I love the trout fish, and, I, you know, people asking how to do it. And I, I have, you know, I, I've done, I've done this show for 11 years. I've gone over and over different times on how to catch redfish or how to catch speckled trout. And I don't want to be redundant. I don't want to say every, every month this is how you do it. So uh, if you want to call me or email me, I can email you back, and I'll have you know little how-to videos. I've got to stack them that you know I can play them over on occasion on you know how to how to fillet a fish, how to throw a cast net. All these, I've done all these things in, in the past on the show, but at times I feel like it's, it's important that I do them again. So if you see, if you've seen them one or two times, I'll bring them on again. It's because. Uh, the people that contact me are these new people moving in, and I love to help them. So if I'm showing something again, it's because I've been contacted by people. I just had an email this weekend. This guy just moved in over here in the, in the uh, uh, South Walton area, and he want to know all about what to do and all that. So he's a you know he's a beginner, and then we have beginners on the show. Then we have you know old pros on the show that, that watch the show. And so I've got to hit sort of the medium. I, I don't want to bore either one. I want to give people information here on how to do it. But I don't want to, you know, for the people who know how to do it, I don't want to keep talking about how to do this, how to do that, because it gets old too. So I have this balance of doing things on the show. And I, I, it's a challenge to me, and I try to keep it fresh. And, and, you know, out of 260 shows a year, we show those five reruns between Christmas and New Year's are the best shows we have. So that's what we do here on Panhandle Outdoors. It's all for you, the audience. And so support our sponsors and always do something good today for your fellow man. You have a great day, and God bless. Thanks for watching America's only daily outdoor TV show, Van Handle Outdoors with Winston Chester, featuring hunting, fishing, and other activities and information to help you enjoy the great outdoors. Join us next time for Panhandle Outdoors.